Thanks for tuning in to another episode around the coin podcast. We got Bruce Pond on the show today. Uh, he is the founder of Ocean Protocol, a blockchain startup focused on bringing data and AI together since 2013. They've raised over $140 million for their foundation. We talked about data, data privacy, what people should consider when they think about selling their data, blocking their data. We talked about GDPR, regulation. This is all about personal data, what you should think about it, what government should have access to, what they shouldn't, what should be regulated. Fascinating conversation considering today in our age, data is the new oil. So how can it integrate with or operate on blockchain and Ocean Protocol is attempting to do that. Hope you enjoy this conversation. Here is Bruce Pan. All right, Bruce, thanks for joining. I'm excited to chat with you today. Uh, so you are you're running a few different projects. You've been involved in many different projects of your career. Ocean Protocol is the, I'd say, largest recognizable protocol that you're involved in now. Um, I'd love to just learn from you what the inspiration was at the time starting the project and how that has evolved into where it's headed today, what the problem that you're trying to solve in the world is. So it's um, it, it, it's just obvious that uh, data is a huge area where people are concerned about. Um, and so Ocean Protocol is trying to solve that problem using Web3 technology. Uh, we see that there's a data economy that is arising right now. And uh, we see that Web3 can be a, a very critical part of orchestration of kind of, uh, you know, kickstarting a data economy without having a middleman. Okay, so talk to me a little bit more about that. What is it, when you say data economy, uh, what, where did the data sources that you're referring to? So uh, what we're seeing is that most of the data right now in Web2 are stuck in large entities, large corporations and silos like uh, Facebook, et cetera. Um, but there's a ton of data out there that's outside of these organizations. And we see that, that that's the other 97%. And the the hypothesis that we worked on was that if you can create a means of data sharing in an open manner using Web3 technology, so clear provenance, clear attribution, clear payments, transparency about what's going on, that you could unlock all the other data as well as give people the ability to demand their data back from places like Facebook, Instagram, what have you. Uh, and so they could have full control over it. Now, the, uh, the sweetener on this is if they have full control over it, there's a good chance that they can also monetize it. Um, and that's where a whole bunch of good things can happen, where people around the world can start monetizing their data. Um, and it gives people opportunity to become, uh, I guess, data farmers, yeah, to create data sets, to generate data on their own and to earn off of that. Just like uh, nowadays, uh, there's this whole group, thousands of YouTubers who talk about various topics and they earn money from that. Hmm. And, and when you think about data, do you think about it as multifaceted in terms of individuals create data based on their own internet surfing experience? And to date, Facebook, Google have turned around, aggregated that data and then served you ads and taken a portion of the advertising dollars that flow through the advertisers to the consumers. That's certainly one kind of category of data. Is that the primary most interesting case or are there other cases as well? You know, that's, that's the most obvious one. Um, but the protocol is meant to be agnostic to the use case of, uh, what type of data, what industry vertical, personal or private corporate or what have you government. Um, the main thing is to start having essentially a protocol or a language uh, the sets of tools and, uh, features that allow people to share data. But I do think that one of the first use cases is something like browser data, your health data, sport and fitness data, social media, all this sort of stuff where everybody feels that they could take more control over that aspect of their life and then maybe put it into some sort of data union or data pool where then somebody's responsible for the custody of it, to protect it, and also to distribute and market it, right? And, then, and that way then people have 
uh, the ability to work mm. with Facebook to sell their data. And we, just in terms of, I know everyone's different, but what would be an approximate value if someone's thinking about the value of their individual data? It, how do you think about assessing that? So there aren't a lot of metrics out there. So for, I think Facebook values each customer at, I think, $100 a year. But if you look at your social graph, your fitness data, your health data, all that sort of stuff, if, if you're selling it just to Facebook, you might get, what, $50, half of that yeah, to make it worthwhile. But the problem is, is that that data is only used once. And the hypothesis that we have is, of course, your data is digital, so you could sell it to a thousand different people. So if you're able to pull up all your data from all your different sources, put it into a data union or something like that, and sell it to a thousand different entities, pharmaceuticals, governments, market research, social media, Amazon, all this type of things, then the sky really is the limit. We, like, we, I, we think that you can definitely earn a good four-figure income from your data in the future if you play it right. Yeah. And to me, it seems like my, my intuitive sense on this, I haven't worked in ad tech, but I would imagine that individual data points are meaningless. In aggregate, they become everything. So obviously the reason why Google, Facebook are valuable is that they can aggregate data. They don't just have one-offs. So if that, if, if what you're saying becomes the distribution of data methods, so everyone is thinking about selling their data many different times to different uh, businesses out there, organizations, I would imagine that organizations then in turn are going to work with poolers, people who can aggregate data together so they can get a larger aggregated pool. So do you see kind of like maybe a, a, like a, a reactionary effect to individuals selling their data multiple times being that these organizations are just going to pool it behind the scenes. There's going to be some company, probably web two company that says, Hey, organizations, give us all the data that you're collecting or you're buying. We're going to, or we're going to aggregate it together and then sell it back to you. Do you think there, is that a threat? Is that a, is that a negative thing? Because that seems like kind of inevitable inevitability yeah there's multiple ways this can play out it can definitely go out that way but the ideal flow that we see is you use a web 2 service or a web 3 service but a web 2 is the main one so you use the web 2 service you download the data that they collect onto you into your web 3 wallet whether it's some stores uh cluster you have on amazon or in Arweave or in Filecoin. And then you opt back in to uh, Data Union, who then sells it back to the, uh, Facebook and whatever. And it's a fundamental difference because Facebook never asked you for their data. It's never a deal that you opted into. You opted in to use the service. And as part of that service, they said, well, we're also going to take your data. And so it's a free service. Therefore, you know, you paid in some other way. It's always the case. But when you look at it that way, you say, well, whatever, I, I use the service and they get my data. And this is a fundamentally different relationship we have now with the Web2 services, if we can get this going, because then you get all your data, you have your data vault, you can choose not to, to sell it, not to share it, not to do anything with it other than keep it for yourself, which people would right, rightfully um, actually feel probably better doing until they understand what's happening with my data. But there's definitely a, a good subset of folks who would be open immediately to selling their data, trying this out and seeing the transparency and the audit trail that might happen in the future by, you know, taking this new deal with your data. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's such an interesting topic because so much of the internet has been paved from the aggregated data pools, you know, such a, so many, so many of the great places on the internet are great precisely because they've been able to aggregate data. And I think I, I sometimes hear more of the periphery from marketers or founders of tech companies that don't have access to good data. Maybe they can't track analytics on their site. It's like, if you blindfold a product manager, they're just going to make a worse product. And, and I think that there's there is a trade off that people either overtly recognize or you know i think people are just seemingly at this crossroads where we're trying to come to terms with what the upside and downside of sharing data is and gdpr the european 
uh, data regulation certainly has made it almost, <laughs> they, I, I'm curious to hear your, your thoughts on the impacts now that we're a few years out, because from, from a consumer pers perspective, all I notice is that every time I go to a website, I get this ugly pop-up that's like allow cookies in order to use the site. And I just accept all the cookies and without thinking about it, and it's just like a tax on the entire internet. But tell me what, what am I missing? What, what's actually happening? The GDPR. So two parts, two parts. Number one is there was a really interesting interview from Mark Andreessen, uh, about four or five weeks ago. I, 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 sorry, I don't know the exact, you know, which interview it was, but he, the, the interview asked him, how did you guys get on advertising? Why is it so prevalent in web two? He says, well, that, that was it. That was the only way we could make money. Um, when you give a free product to, to take away the speed bump of getting people to use your product. The only way that we could start charging people at that stage, it wasn't subscriptions because there was no internet payments. There was no v pay with visa. There's no subscription. There was nothing. The only way we could, um, get revenue was advertising. And then that got baked into web two. So that is a fundamental feature of web two. Um, and so that's what we're trying to change now. That was the original sin of the internet. You, you could say the original internet had two sins. Number one, the free flow of data, which is a feature and a sin, because that free flow of data meant that you couldn't monetize that data uh, and intellectual property. That's why we have like pictures and images all over the internet, music, movies, all that sort of, that was what the first original sin. The second one was that we use advertising as the base model for revenue generation. That's Facebook, Google, Apple, Amazon, all that sort of stuff, not Apple, but yeah. So that, that's the answer to like kind of the, the comment you made before. Now, GDPR failed policy. Heart was in the right place. Crappy execution. The, the worst execution you could ever think of. It's government the way that you imagine government to be in not a positive sense. Yeah. Um, in terms of the execution. Now, what Ocean is, is looking at GDPR from the perspective of the user and saying, users want to monetize their data or they want to at least have control over it. And GDPR is meant to give users control. But the problem is GDPR is bolted onto this original sin, which is advertising based business models. So this cookies, these pop-ups, it's a waste. It's a, it's use, it's a, ta it's exactly what we said. It's a tax on the attention. It's a crappy user experience for the entire globe because this economic, uh, 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 block of 500 million people or the government that decided that this is the way the internet should look failed policy, but the heart was in the right place. And I, I, I strongly believe that web three and ocean are trying to, to do GDPR the way it, it should have been done and could have been done. Yeah. Yeah. It, it seems to me that the regulators recognize the problem, the, the original sin, as you put it, but they were overconfident in their ability to solve the problem using the existing technological frameworks. And that, that seems to be the, the flaw in judgment is that you can just force people to change. It's like basically saying the deal was, Hey, the government now requires that every company ask each user to opt in for data. Well, that's exactly what happened is they, the company said either don't use our service or get, click this button that says you, you opt into the data. And it's like, yeah, you can choose to not use the internet. You know, no one has stopped you previously. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, know, you need fundamentally different technological framework to, to, to implement this kind of change. Uh, and I, I wonder, do you, do you feel that people like, what is the, what's the, You've, I'm sure you've done much more research on this. Like, what's the general psychology of, of people? Are people more interested in making money off of surfing the internet and selling their data? Or are they more interested in their data being harvested and somehow used against them? Because there is an advantage that the individual the consumer sees when they opt into giving their data and that they see better advertisements. I'd rather, like, there's value add when a friend shows me a cool, like e-bike that I might be interested in buying, or if Facebook showed me a very relevant shoe that I might be interested in buying, if they show me a, you know, a pair of women's, you know, jackets, I'm just, it's just like poor experience because I didn't opt into that data. So there's, there's increased advertising experience with opting into the data. Do you think people are of the mindset they'd like to just pay $50 a year and not see any ads? Um, 
Yeah. How do you feel the psychology of people today on the internet? So I, I, I would, I would break down into like a two dimensional matrix. Number one is, um, convenience and nefariousness, uh, convenience is most people just say, just get me to the website. Don't bother me with this crap, you know, and, and there's a very small subset of people who are going to be like, well, tell me they want to read the fine print. Uh, tell me what you're going to do with my data, all that sort of stuff. Right. So that's the first kind of access. And let's say 95% of people are just like take me to the internet. And then the other access is the nefariousness is what are you doing with my data? And once again, people are aware because we've already had prior examples of data being used against them and weaponized against them, that they're going to be very, very cautious with this type of thing. And they feel viscerally, I don't want to use any bad words. Like they, they just feel viscerally abused. And that is something that the that once again is a feature of web two and not a bug. And I don't know how we, that's the hard part. How do you turn the corner on that one? So people start to want to share their data. And I believe that it's going to be a long journey, but transparency, who uses data, when, how, and what did I get paid for this allows people to start gauging what they share and how much to share. I went, I'll use myself as a personal example. I'm usually one of the very first to adopt technologies. So I was first on Facebook. I was first on MySpace, all this kind of stuff. And I shared my stuff. I, I was learning the, the, and now I share nothing. I'm off all the social media because we know that that data has been used against us and maybe not personally against me, but at, in aggregate, it's been used against us. We know that society is somehow splitting into multiple tribes and such like that. And a lot of it has to do with web too. So, um, it's going to take a lot to turn it around, but you, you need to have these pieces where people know where their data is going. And if they have a chance to monetize, then they have that choice, but only through transparency, you know, what they, that they say, white light sanitizes everything, um, and exposes all the misdeeds. And so we need to have the same thing in web three, uh, for data to kickstart that data economy. Mm. Do you, I, what, one thing that comes to mind too, is, uh, the differential between the types of data, you know, if a company asks for my social security number, uh, there's a, there's like hierarchy of intimacy of data. You know, if they ask for my personal address, uh, they ask for my data, like I'd say it's probably social security number. Um, you know, the, you know, sometimes they ask like banks will ask the, uh, where, what street did you grow up on? What's your mother's maiden name? Like there's probably. <laughs> I don't know. What's your first pet? What's your, what's your first car? Like there's 10 questions that if I knew them about you, I could probably do some bad stuff. So there's like, uh, you know, those questions, the things that are, that are non-fungible specific to me, Th then there's like personal contact information, email, phone number, telegram, what's all these things. And then there's like, then there's just my surfing data. It's like, what kind of device am I on? Uh, what, what time of day I'm using the site. Like these are things I think product managers use to build better products. Like a product manager doesn't need my SSN, my phone number, my email. They don't need anything personal to me. Is this the right way to think about data is that it's bucketed into like personal, non-personal or trivial, non-trivial. Because if I think from a consumer's perspective, I'm willing to give them all that if I can trade that for a free and great experience, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm thinking about this in the wrong way. And so I, I is, does that make sense? Is that how people think about it too? I, I think definitely people could think about this, like uh, from an initial, if you're looking at this problem, but I, I, I don't think that's the, the way it really works. I think that, you know, I, I had this. This is a story. I had this dawning once where I, I had an iPhone eight and I realized that it didn't matter how wealthy you were in the world. That was the best you could get. You could be Bill Gates. Well, obviously he wouldn't have an iPhone, but you, you could be the wealthiest person and the iPhone is all you can get. Um, if you look at a car, a Lamborghini or whatever, or Maybach or whatever, that's the best you can get. And. That is the power of web three, as well as the web, by the way, in that the user experience that I get and you get is the same as what the King of England gets. 
And I think that that is the way to think about data, where it's not about your private data or your public data or your whatever your social graph. It's not about that. It's that if you can get the experience where everybody has that base layer of transparency on and they compartmentalize themselves where they put their own data according to their comfort level and the ability for them to track what happens to that, then it doesn't matter who you are or what data you want to share. You could just say, you could be completely anarchic and just say, I give you everything, make money off it. Or you could be completely, you know, like a monk and say, I give you nothing. Uh, and then when we have that, where everybody on earth can make that their own decision, doesn't matter. Personal, private, you know, do go crazy. Yeah. Mm. Uh, a quick aside, w when you get a new device, when you get an iPad or an iPhone, computer or something, you know the question that they always ask you, which is, will you give us your user data? Like, I think they call it the, like, crash report For, yeah. data to help develop yeah. us all bugs. Yeah. Should I opt into that or no? <laughs> I don't know. I don't. <laughs> You know, it, it depends, you know, Apple has taken a very hard line stance because they sell <laughs> hardware, right? Yeah. You know, Apple, Apple has taken a very hard line stance mm. saying we sell you devices, not your data. Whereas somebody else, like you, for instance, the Google phone, you might, you might want to say, no, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. That that's the problem. We don't have transparency of this. Yeah. 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 One thing I, while we're on this subject is it's so interesting. It's so important. I mean, I, I'm sure you think about it and talk about it all the time. I feel like this became mainstream top of mind with the Edward Snowden whistleblower event when in 2000 and I forget the timing on it, but you know, he was world famous event for basically saying that the U S government has uh backdoor loopholes backdoors into major tech companies. And there's mass surveillance going on across the world. And I think that was a, a gut check for many people to say, holy shit, this is potentially way more severe. You know, and you mentioned Apple taking the hard line. They would likely take this hard line because they don't even want to have the option to go and get that data. If they, if they know if, if it's technically possible, then the U.S. government could come to their headquarters and with guns and say, hey, we need these people's information. But if they technically can't do it, that's kind of the magic. That's the magic of blockchain. That's the magic of uh, cryptography is that you can just build the system so you don't have the temptation. Do you feel that since Edward Snowden's release of all this, that there has been a, a sufficient and, and proper um, reaction from the public? Or do you feel that public is undervaluing this or appropriately valuing it. I, I know that one last thing I'll add is I think Edward Snowden, somebody asked him in an interview, what's the big, what's your biggest fear? And in response to that, he said, I fear that people will not recognize the importance of government surveillance and they won't take a strong enough action. And I put that to you to, to hear your reaction. I'm absolutely torn by the revelations of Edward Snowden, number one, because I, I do believe he took one for the team. He, his heart was in the right place and that he really wanted a, us to know what was happening behind the scenes. And I, where the, where I'm torn is that we look at the world today and there's a lot of bad people in them, individuals, entities, governments, state actors. And when you compare. Think about it in the starkness of who is keeping us safe at night when we sleep. It's the three letter agencies. And I know which three letter agencies I want to be on my side. And so on one hand, I admire that stand he took, and I'm glad that it's proven what is being done on our, in the name of society. But at the same time, I would be remiss to say that I take for granted these people who work lurk in the shadows to protect us and what was lost because of these revelations. It's a very difficult, there's no right answer, right? Now, in terms of how society has changed because of these revelations, like I said, most people just go through life 
and they're worrying about like nowadays it's energy, it's gas, it's paying the rent, paying for food. They're not so concerned about this data. And so, but it does matter at the fringes. If you're a political prisoner or like, you know, you're a journalist, you're somebody who's doing something where, uh, somebody in government might not like what you're doing, or the police force might not like what you're doing. Yeah, it can be used against you. We've seen that in Russia. We've seen that also in North America with the truckers, with, um, you know, some activists and such like that targeted on both sides, left and right, uh, using the technology and using the tools that are available. So, you know, for the vast majority of people, 95%, it, as long as the, the rest of the levers of government are functioning the way that they're designed to for a democracy or for, you know, a, a, a people driven uh, society, it works, but there's always going to be that one to 5% where it is a matter of life and death, this type of question. And I don't know the right answer. I, I really don't. And I'm not, I'm not going to pretend that I know anything, what the three letter agencies are going through, as well as the people who are fighting for something they truly believe in and are getting, I guess this, this onslaught of technology on them to get the data that somebody else wants, you know, everybody's trying to do it in the best they can, but, um, there's no easy, easy answers. I, I think that's an imperfect response, but that's the best I got. Slightly related to that. There's a lot of debate or there has, there, there was a period of time where there, there was a lot of debate on the whether or not the government, the federal government in the United States should ban TikTok, being that TikTok is a Chinese owned company and China bans Facebook and I believe Google. It seems like the, the international front for, uh, for effectively war is not physical violence anymore, but data. And I, I don't know the answer to this. This is one where I, I certainly could see the massive uh, price that a country can pay by using a platform that effectively is, has a back as a strong and obvious backdoor. I mean, China is absolutely has a rude access to TikTok, and it's the fastest growing social media network on the planet. And effectively China owns that. I mean, for all intents and purposes. And I don't know. I, I don't know what should be done, but I, I know it seems like China has taken a hard and early stance against letting other social networks into China for a reason, and they want to own that themselves. Do you see this as the as a serious threat to like states and national national security, or, or do you think it's kind of overblown? Unfortunately, I I I've come. I started from a place of being, let's say center left. And now I find more and more that I'm leaning center right. And I think that something like TikTok is absolutely a matter of national security, unfortunately. So, so you're, you, you're going from center left to center right. What, what is, what, can you elaborate on that? What does that mean practically? Because, because, um, I think center left is a little bit more idealistic and seeing the way the world is going. I think that pragmatism will do us well. And I think that the, um, the data, as you had said, the geolocation data, the targeting data on the individuals who are using TikTok and all these sort of things. That is a matter of national security for Western nations, um, unfortunately. And I, I think that that is typically more of a right wing kind of a defensive posture, conservative in the sense of realizing that these tools can be used against us and to then take appropriate measures to mitigate them as best as we can. Mm. Uh, yeah. It, it, so I guess, do you think the U S should ban TikTok? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a politician. I, like I said, I, I think that given where the world is, uh, that the, if the U S was the ban TikTok, I think it would be potentially justified. Mm. 
Yeah, boy, I will say though, just a, a side on this. I think if we, if the smartest people in society, people like yourself who think about encryption and technological advancement in data, uh, if, if the, if, if we just leave it to politicians who can barely operate an iPhone eight, then we're all screwed. <laughs> That's one thing I'm uh, pretty, pretty strong stanced on is that you know, a big part of this podcast is like, Hey, let's, who cares? Right? Like, like, let's just say what we think and then bounce ideas around and, and say, this is we're, we're, the, the good thing is you and I are not going to make a decision. We're not politicians, but hopefully through the, you know, my, my highest hope here is that through these kind of conversations, we can say, okay, I have an impartial, incomplete view of the world, but here's my intuition. Here's what I've seen. And then there's kind of an engagement with another perspective that then turns into a, a more sophisticated perspective. And I think the technology piece of it, like at Ocean Protocol, is, is the opportunity to move things forward because GDPR did not work largely because it just was a forcing function on the existing tech framework, but the distributed blockchain protocol methods of securing, transferring data on smart contracts, all these things are constantly moving forward. And I, I'm, I wanna ask you about the, the technological potential of not only just personal data, but what, what, what does this look like going forward? Are we in 10 years from now, we'll talk again. Am I still going to be worried about TikTok and Chinese interference in companies? Or do you see there just being some technological advancement, cryptographic encryption that just makes data sharing, it just changes the game. Like, do, do you see, have you seen the potential for that to happen to where it's like, it, yeah, no longer becomes an issue? I would... I would frame the response in two ways. Number one is technology is agnostic. And I think that web three technology is designed so that anybody can use it. And it's built from the right philosophical basis of individual strength, individuals, um, autonomy. Now, granted that is not necessarily the perspective of some other cultures, like Asia, some Asian cultures are uh, way more collectively oriented, right? So. The fact that web three is meant to give power back to individuals is in some ways an antithesis towards some cultures that value the collective. So already there's a moral, um, stand from the perspective of web three, it's it just the way it is. And so, but it is agnostic. So anybody can use it. So the fact that it starts from the individual first, and then anybody can use it, that doesn't change that it's agnostic. And then the second thing is how does it all play out? And I think that it's instructive to look at, for instance, the current war in the Ukraine right now, where it is both a kinetic war, it's an information space, it's a cyber war, uh, as well as a technology war with drones and some of the latest stuff. And here is where I have become way more pragmatic. Number one, it's clear what side you want to be on. Number two is the the field of warfare has already been shaped long before this um this latest hot phase in the ukraine um kick-started in february 2022 the information warfare space had been prepared by other state entities we know this it's been proven um long ago for the last 10 years and so web3 unlocking personal data and giving people transparency on where it's used hopefully also helps in this regard, because one of the challenges with web two was that it was completely intransparent, what was being used with our data. The fact that it was being weaponized against us, the fact that it was already being used to start, um, curating and preparing and softening, um, the information landscape to split us up into our tribes more distinctly so that it would be easier for hostile entities and nations to split us up even more in a time when there is a war, you know, work on the inflation, work on the energy problem, work on the splitting people up along very clear fault lines. This is part of information warfare now. So 
Yeah, I guess that's the answer, right? Number one is technology is agnostic, even if it starts from some sort of moral stance. It has to start from some sort of moral stance. And then on top of that, every entity is using the information that is generated for nefarious means and to prepare an information warfare space. Um, and it, as I said, it's more and more clear to me that I know what side I want to be on. And I'm going to fight for that in the ways that I can while hewing to the ability to give more people power um, with the technology so that it can do things agnostically. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. I think that was a very uh, wise perspective. It, it does feel like the concern that we must have for the international affairs is growing. So, you know, it feels <laughs> like maybe for the last 30, 40 years, you could basically do your job, you know, focus on building technology, focus on doing whatever you do and not really think about it. I think having kind of a, a large, the United States kind of being the largest country militarily, economically made it so there wasn't, there was a low, a period of low volatility. And I think that's a psychological shift for many people across the world to say, we, we can't just opt out of these conversations at some point, like they just become far too relevant, you know, in, in 1938, you can't just say, oh, well, I'm just going to focus <laughs> on, you know, building cars like in Germany, like you have to be thinking about what, what's happening in the world. Should I leave? Should I stay? What should I do? And so I, I, I don't think we're headed to a, a mirror that pathway, but certainly there's so many things changing on such a high level that it's like there's a there's a necessity that people have to have for coming to a certain perspective on the the world economic shifts right it's like the te tectonic plates are moving and we we need to figure out where they're going to settle it affects everyone yeah i think i think when you put when the stakes are down and you you see it black and white that's what you're coming to Jesus moment. Um, that's when you realize what's important and what's, you know, and actually there's nothing wrong with somebody saying, I'm just going to build cars. I'm just going to do this. I don't want to know anything about the world. There's actually nothing wrong with that, but what we all owe to ourselves and to the society around us is to make sure that we are taking ownership and responsibility for taking care of ourselves, having enough money set aside. Um, having enough supplies at home so that when these supply shocks happen, high inflation, all that sort of stuff, taking care of debts and stuff like that, doing all these things to protect yourself and be, make yourself more resilient. Um, and then once you've taken care of yourself, helping the people around you, um, I, I forget who had said this, but you know, socialism should be around your immediate family and then capitalism should be out in the world outside of your immediate circle. And I actually buy into that a lot more now. So by taking care of yourself, um, sticking to your grind, uh, and making sure that you've gotten yourself and your friends and your family covered, that's the best you can do in today's world. Because none of us, we, we not, we, we all don't need to save the world. We just need to save us and the people around us. And I think that's noble enough. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> save, well, I may, may you say everyone, everyone needs to save their own world. That's probably, uh, <laughs> on point with what you're saying. Um. Origin Protocol Foundation. Origin uh, Protocol made, Foundation. Somewhere in the order of 140 million for grants. Um, what's where are you guys headed now? Like, what's the what's the top of mind direction for either the foundation, the protocol projects that you're involved in around ocean? Um, yeah. So we've been working on this project now for since 2017. So it's almost five years. We delivered everything that we promised in our original white paper. It was a long journey of four or five years. And now we have a little bit more flexibility. And I think it's good to have a little bit more flexibility to, to see where we should be focusing more attention to right now. So we have this community that's pretty, I'm pretty proud of. We, it's, it's a global community, a bunch of developers, a bunch of people who are crypto fanatics, as well as a burgeoning group of data scientists. And now the question is, given that this technology is completely agnostic, what experiments do we run to see where adoption happens faster? 
We think that doxing can happen along a broad front, but where could it happen faster to demonstrate to either data scientists or to crypto enthusiasts or to developers that they should devote more attention to ocean. And so for the next year or two, that is essentially where we're going to be spending our time. We have a couple of cool projects in the works. Um, we generally don't announce them before we've launched because we want to have, we, we've always had a philosophy of deliver first and then talk about it um, to the chagrin of our community. But we think that that's the most intellectually honest at this stage. We do give high level plans in terms of where we think we're going, but right now we're in the, a new kind of planning stage because we've delivered on everything that we planned uh, for the last five years. Gotcha. So, so stay tuned. Give me like a high level. So, so far the things that have been done are, how do you describe like the most important accomplishments and then just like general direction going forward? So we developed a base layer of, of orchestrating of the handshake between data owners and data buyers, that basic orchestration. We built on top of that, uh, a way that you could preserve privacy. So that if a, a, a provider gave data that it wouldn't get exposed. So they wanted to be able to share without exposing it. So that, that what, that's one piece of technology we built. And then we built on top of that kind of this infrastructure for monetizing the data using some innovations in the Ethereum space, like the ERC 721 token and a couple of, you know, mix and match type of tokens where you can then, uh, securitize your data. You can fractionalize ownership of it. And then you can also find different ways to kind of NFT, uh, use, use your data as an, uh, represent your data as an NFT. So this is some of the stuff we've been working on for, for the last 10 years, actually nine years. Um, and we built it into ocean. So that's what, where we've come from for the last four or five years, where we're going into the start into the future is we think that continuing to integrate further into DeFi with data. So using the tools of DeFi. So help price data to help, uh, facilitate the flow, uh, of data is useful. Also tooling for the data economy in the future. So DevOps type of things, very technical modules and tools that allowed practitioners, data scientists to really use the protocol on top of that base layer. That's pretty much the direction we're heading right now. That's awesome. And Bruce, who, if there is any individual people, uh, books, blogs, are there certain areas that come to the top of your mind when you think of what has inspired you or educated you over the years that you want to throw out there? Cool. Look, um, Hernando de Soto was a big one, actually. Hernando de Soto, I think he, he wrote about, uh, dead capital and the ability for people to get title on their land, uh, is the best indicator for a burgeoning middle class and wealth of a nation. And so that was one of the inspirations of ocean was the ability to give people title to their data in a way that wasn't possible previously. And in the digital world, we need to have, and if people can get title on their data using web three technology, I think that we have 8 billion people who can participate if they choose to in a new world and earn money from it. It's universal basic income. That's not socialist. It's purely capitalist, but it gives everybody the equal opportunity doesn't guarantee the outcome. And I think that that is the noble goal that we should all aim for. Mm. Awesome. Bruce has been a lot of fun. I appreciate you entertaining me and going in different directions <laughs> and congrats <laughs> on all the progress with ocean. I hope you guys uh, accomplish your wildest dreams and help make people's data more private and accessible and controllable. Uh, look forward to having you back on someday. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bruce.